I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me back to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've been studying for the last several weeks in the book of 1 Thessalonians. In this book we really see Paul's heart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, when you find your place, we'll begin reading in verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or our joy of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Let's pray. Father... We come before you this morning in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for loving us. Father, I pray as we look into your word this morning that you would give us understanding through your Holy Spirit. Guide us into all truth, we pray. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been looking in the book of 1 Thessalonians, as I've already said, we really see Paul's heart. For the church, but never more than in this text that we've read this morning. We see a little bit about how Paul feels about the church. You know, sometimes we, uh, maybe as men, like to hide our feelings at times, but Paul didn't seem to do that, especially when he was writing to these churches. He poured out his feelings. He opened up and, and revealed what he was thinking and how he was feeling about the people. In fact, we see in this particular text how he literally felt torn away from the church when he had to leave. And so Paul is, is telling us some things about his feelings toward the church, but in this particular text, he's also telling us about his service to the church. Paul's service to the church. And so we're going to be looking at that thought this morning, Paul's service to the church, and looking at how our service to the church and to the people of God should be as well. We start off in verse 17, but well, we're going to look at four different thoughts this morning as we go along. Uh, we're going to look at Paul served with love for the church. Paul served with love for the church. Paul believed service was better with a personal touch. Paul believed that service was better with a personal touch. Also, Paul served with opposition. Paul served with opposition. And then lastly, Paul served with the end in mind. Paul served with the end in mind. But starting off at the beginning of verse 17, it says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers. He goes on to say, In person, not in heart. We endeavor the more eagerly to, and with great desire to see you. So in this, we're looking at Paul's service to the church. And the first thing we come to is Paul served with love for the church. Now, I'm thankful that we get to see this in Scripture. I have an example of how to love the church from the Apostle Paul. But even greater than that, Paul was following a greater example than himself, and that was Jesus. What greater example of love for the church do we have than Jesus? Jesus uh, loved the church enough that he came, the Bible says. He gave himself up for her. Ephesians 5.25, he died for the church, died for his people, that they could have eternal life. That's how much Jesus loved the church. And Paul, following the example of Christ, also loved the church. And so we see Paul's love for the church. We see that in two different ways in this text. Number one, we see that Paul was connected to the church. Paul is connected to the church. Paul views them really as his family. In fact, in the preceding text last week, we spoke about how Paul compared his love for the church as a mother caring for her child or caring for her children. What greater love is there than a mother loving her children and protecting her children and caring for her nursing child? Such a picture of tenderness and compassion and love that she is giving herself for the child. And so Paul sees himself as the mother of these people in, in, in a certain way. And he also compared himself as the father. 
He said, as a father trains or as a father instructs his children, so I am instructing you. So not only does Paul see himself connected to the church through tenderness and compassion as a mother, but also through the instruction of the father. Where do we receive our instruction? I can still remember from when I was a child certain things that my father told me of not to do this or to do that or when you get on your own, do things this way. I can remember he tried to instill instruction in my heart and wisdom in my heart. And Paul takes on that role for the church of trying to instruct them in the way that they should go. Paul dearly loves this church because he feels connected to the church. And then in this text, Paul uses a very endearing word. He says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers... So he looks at them as his children, as he's a mother. He looks at them as his children, as he's a father. And he also looks at them as his brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul invested much in this church. Now, we understand as we go back to the book of Acts chapter 17 and find where Paul planted the church in Thessalonica that he was not able to stay there long. This was not a long-tenured pastor pastorate for Paul. He was only there for at most a few months. But in those few months, he gave of himself for the church. We spoke about that last week, how he didn't even take money from the church for support. Uh, the church at Philippi, the place where he had been previously to Thessalonica, they sent some support. But he said, we work night and day so that we would not be a burden to you. He loved this church. So Paul served the church with love. And we should look at the people of God. And just as Christ so loved the church, just as Paul loved the churches that he dealt with, we should have love for one another. We should have love for the church because we should feel a connection to the church. There is a connection between us and the church. We have been bought together, been bought together by the blood of Christ. You are my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am your brother in Christ. And even the extended church, the extended body of Christ throughout this world, we have a connection with them. You see, we have a connection with them that we don't have with anybody else in the world. I know we share common grounds with other people even outside of the church, but none greater than the common ground we share within the church, which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been saved by the grace of God. We have been delivered by His grace and His mercy. We have received the mercy of God instead of the wrath of God. And what a wonderful thing it is to share this in common. We have a connection with the body of Christ. We are are a family. We see that Paul was connected to the church, but he also was committed to the church. He was committed, he says, but since we were torn away, we were torn away, and he goes on for a short time. He says, we endeavored more eagerly and with great desire to see you. What does he mean by torn away? If you go back to Acts chapter 17 and you begin to rehearse that story and, and see that story for what it was, Paul was ministering to the church at Thessalonica. But And many people were getting saved. Some Jews were getting saved. He always would go to the synagogues first. And then some Gentiles were getting saved. Some of the, the Bible says the, the honorable or the chief women in the town. They began to come to Christ. And others began to follow Christ after their lead. And so Paul is leading people to Christ. The church was growing. Things were going well. And then all of a sudden, that same group of people who we're going to talk about in a little bit later on, that same group of people who would always try to hinder Paul's ministry, that same group of people, the Orthodox, the, uh, the, the religious Jews of the day who did not accept the gospel, they would come against Paul. And they always wanted to see Paul uh, fall. They always wanted to see Paul go through tough times and that the gospel wouldn't be heard. And so they came against him and they began to tell lies to the chiefs of the city that Paul was uh, trying to get them to serve another king other than Christ. Now there was a certain amount of truth to that. Paul did want them to serve Christ as king. Paul did not call on them to rebel against the government, however. As long as what the government tells us to do as Christians does not go against God's law, we honor, this, we honor man's law. But the moment it tells us to go against God's law, that's when we honor God's law instead and we forsake man's law. There is a time for civil disobedience as a child of God when man's government commands us to go against God's law. But Paul had instructed them and had instructed other churches to obey man's laws as long as, long as it doesn't go there, as long as it doesn't do that. But he did want them to serve Christ as king first and foremost. And so they brought these accusations against Paul. They, they uh, incited a riot 
to where they came to the house where Paul was staying. He was not there at that particular time. But they took over the house and they, they kidnapped the owner of the house, Jason, and brought him before the council. And there they caused Jason to uh, pay a certain amount of money and promise that Paul would not come back. So when this happened, Paul and Silas had to leave Thessalonica. So notice what he says. He says that we were torn away. What this phrase torn away actually means is bereaved. Paul said it's like I lost a child. It's like, like I lost a family member. I was bereaved of you. That death took you away from me. And we all know we've all been there in life when there's someone we love dearly and we were torn away from them by death. Paul said that's the feelings I have in my heart. I love you so much and I want to be with you so much to help you and guide you and teach you that when I was thrown away, when I was taken away from you, I felt like I was, had been bereaved of your presence. Paul was committed to the church. And then he said, we tried the more and more endeavored to be with you so we could see you. Paul was committed. We need this commitment to the body of Christ. We need to see our lives in the church as servants. We need to see that, that we are servants of Christ in His church. We are servants of one another. And we must be connected with one another by the gospel and committed to the gospel and committed to one another that we will serve one another in the faith. Paul was connected to the church and he was committed to the church. So we see that Paul served the church with love. But secondly, Paul believed that service was better with a personal touch. He, he, he goes on in uh, verse 17, he says, but in the beginning of verse 17, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly with great desire to see you face to face, to see you face to face face to face. Now he had already said we were torn away from you in person but not in heart. Paul said I'm still with you in spirit. Now we hear that all the time. A lot of times when people don't come to church they'll say well I'm with you in spirit preacher. Well this is kind of where that phrase comes from. Paul says I'm with you. I'm thinking about you. I desire to be with you though I cannot physically be with you. If Paul was able to be with them he would have been with them at this time but that was not the will of God for him at this moment. But Paul is expressing his desire to be there because the reason he's expressing this is because they there has been some accusations against Paul. There have been some of the enemies trying to incite um, the people to have hard feelings against Paul and the missionaries saying that he doesn't want to be with you. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't want to see you. He left and now he's happy to be gone. But Paul is telling them there's nothing further from the truth. I tried to get back to you. I'm with you in spirit even though I can't be with you in, in the person. But also, not only that, I desire to see you face to face. Paul believed that service was better with the personal touch. Now, Paul would write letters to churches. I'm not certain that Paul ever made it back to Thessalonica. I don't know that we're told if Paul made it back. Maybe he came back to check on him at one time. But as far as Paul able to stay there for an extended period of time, I don't know that Paul was ever able to do that. However... Paul said, I desire to see you face to face. And the reason Paul desired to see him face to face was because he believed that if he was face to face with them, he could teach them better. He could, he could instruct them better. They could see the example that he's living in his life and they would know how to live for God. Something that we lack in the church, in many churches today. Now we talk about it. We hear about it. We say we're doing it at times, but I believe this is one of the areas that we fail at is discipleship personal discipleship. Now we believe in evangelism. We believe in telling people about Christ and expressing the gospel message to people that they would hear the gospel and be saved by the grace of God. We believe in that wholeheartedly. This church we believe in the great commission. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We believe as, as we're a part of the Southern Baptist Convention we send funds to the cooperative program that sends funds out to missionaries to help them preach the gospel around the world. Amen to that. Keep doing that. But we also need to have a personal touch with people in our community and, and tell them the gospel, to speak the gospel. But we shouldn't even stop there. We do not stop with evangelism. We move on to discipleship. As Paul said, Paul had already led many of these people to Christ. But Paul said, I desire to be with you face to face. So I can sit down with you and study the Bible together. So I can sit down with you and share your burdens. So I can sit with you and walk with you in, a daily, uh, in our daily lives and live life together. There is something that's very important about a personal touch. 
You know, in many churches today, there's, and I know there's different methods. As long as the, as the message doesn't change, that's the most important part. But there's even some methods beginning to change of kind of piping in preachers on video. And that's the only sermon that people hear. There's some churches that are being planted where they'll have a campus pastor, but then the sermon that they hear is another man in another, maybe another city, maybe another part of the city, and he's preaching through, a, through that. Well, that, that. I'm not saying that it's wrong. But I'm saying this, it's better with a personal touch. It's better when you have someone who sits with you, who knows you, and you know them, and you watch their lives, and they watch your lives, and you're building a connection and building a relationship together, and you're growing in grace and knowledge together. There is something I believe that is very important about a personal touch with the congregation. So I believe Paul expresses that, that he wants to be with them face to face. But not only does he believe that Service is better with a personal touch. In his service to the church, he, he, he served the church with love. He believed that service was better with a personal touch. And then Paul also served with opposition. He served with opposition. Now, notice what it says here in verse 18. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. Now, Paul's not just separating himself and saying, well, they don't want to come to you, but I want to come to you. No, Paul is just emphasizing his desire to come to them. I, Paul, again and again... What's the next phrase here? But Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. Now Paul understood something. Paul understood something very important that we need to understand as the body of Christ. We have an enemy today. We have an enemy that's real. We have an enemy that hates us. We have an enemy that hates Christ and hates his cause and hates his work and hates the work of the Holy Spirit. And that is the devil. Now, I know we, we've almost turned him into mythology today. And that's just what he wants. We kind of almost think of the devil as more of a presence of evil instead of a person. But no, he's a person. And as you study the Word of God and what the Bible says about the devil, we know that the devil was one of the angels that was with God in heaven at one time. But then he rebelled against God. He said, I will ascend above the Most High. I deserve worship. I deserve praise. And God cast him out of heaven. His name was Lucifer. God cast him out of heaven. He became the devil. He took a third of the angels, deceived a third of the angels. They came with him. And now the devil is the enemy of the church. That's important to know something of the devil. That he is not, it's not, what's the opposite of love? Hate. What's the opposite of light? Dark. What's the opposite of God? It's not the devil. It's the opposite of God's not the devil. Here's what I mean by that. Light and darkness are the same. Are the, the, they're the opposite, but they're equal. Good and evil. But, but God doesn't have an opposite. God is at a pinnacle on his own. There is no one that is his exact opposite. The devil is below God. The devil is not sovereign. The devil does not have all power, though he has power. The devil is not omnipresent. The devil is not omniscient. We should not give the devil more credit than he's due. But he is still powerful. He is still a great enemy. And he has a great hatred for the church. And Paul knew that the devil was behind in this opposition. The devil was opposing him so that the gospel would not be preached. Paul knew that the devil wanted to hinder his ministry. And sometimes the devil uses different means to do this. And these people who hated Paul, these religious Jews who hated the gospel, he knew that the devil was behind them as they were doing what they were doing. We, we see that the devil, it's not uncommon for the devil to use people, even at times maybe, to use a believer. What do I mean by that? Do you remember when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And some said, well, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? What did Peter say? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He had the right answer. But then immediately after that, Christ began to teach them how he must die on the cross, how he must go and die. And Peter says, oh, that'll never happen. I'll never let that happen. What did Jesus say to Peter? Now, just before, just a few moments before, Jesus, uh, Peter gave a good, righteous, spirit-filled answer. Now what does Jesus say to Peter? He said, get behind me, Satan, for the things that you're saying are not of God. See, the, Jesus knew that the devil had used Peter to say what he said. The devil did not want Jesus to go to the cross. The devil did not want Jesus to be the sacrifice for mankind. That's why he tried to tempt Christ in the wilderness. 
And so that Christ would sin so he would not be uh, the perfect Lamb of God. But Christ overcame that. Christ did live the perfect life. Not only did he die the perfect death, but he lived the perfect life. That is an important uh, part of the gospel that he lived. He lived the life that we should have lived. He lived the life that we could not live. And then he died the death that we could not die. But the devil was in opposition to him. And now the devil's also in opposition to the church. The devil does not want this church to grow. The devil wants this church to die. Now he don't mind if we meet. He doesn't mind if we meet. As long as we don't care why we're here. He doesn't mind if we meet and talk and have a little singing and have a little sermonette. As long as we don't truly understand and learn the word of God. You see, the devil doesn't mind if Christians meet, but the devil doesn't want Christians to grow in grace and knowledge. He wants us to be a hindrance to other people. He wants to bring hindrances in our lives to not allow us to live for Christ and to grow in grace and knowledge. The devil is our enemy, and he is actively seeking to destroy your life today. Peter warned about him when he said that the devil is a roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is real, and he is your enemy. And he has demons that he has set out for that purpose. The Bible talks about the fiery darts of Satan, those temptation, those things that happens, and that, that, that is demonic activity. We must not believe that the devil or demons is a myth. They are real, and they are truly against you, and we truly battle against them. Paul said that we battle not, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. There are, real, there are real things that are against the people of God. And, and Paul knew this. And Paul served with opposition. But something that is important is Paul still served. Paul knew what, we, what he was up against. Paul knew that there was hindrances to the gospel. He knew there was hindrances to the ministry that the devil did not want the gospel preached. And the devil had used people who hate the gospel to try to tear Paul down again and again and again. And if anybody had a reason to quit on God, if anybody had a reason to say, you know what, I'm not going to preach the gospel anymore. You know what, I'm not going to serve the church anymore. If anybody had a reason to quit, it was Paul. But Paul did not quit. He continued to serve the church. He considered... He continued to love the Lord his God with all of his heart, with all of his mind and soul and strength. He continued to be a servant to the church, even though it was killing him. Oh, there were times when Paul felt alone. You go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and read how what Paul felt like. He felt like he was alone at times. He felt like everyone had forsaken him and many had. But he said this in 2 Timothy 4. He said, but the Lord stood with me. That's what keeps us going. That's what helps us in this life. Even though we know that we have an enemy. We look at the culture around us. Look at America. Hey, this is not, this is not the America that your daddy was raised in. We live, of course, it was, it's always been a wicked culture. But now we see that it is, even seems to be more open. But we as the church of Jesus Christ still go on. We still live for Christ. We still serve Christ. We're still going to obey God even if it costs us. That's important. It may cost us to live for God. But even if it costs us, even if it costs our family, maybe health, maybe uh, safety, we're going to continue to live for Christ. Paul was committed even in the face of opposition. He served the church in love. He, he believed that service was better with a personal touch. He served the church in opposition, but also, lastly, he served with the end in mind. What do I mean by this? Paul, speaking of the opposition, he said, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? So he's speaking of the future. Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. Paul served with the end in mind, and we should serve with the end in mind as well. Paul knew that there was coming a day when he was going to have to give an account to Jesus Christ. Paul knew there was coming a day when Jesus Christ would right all wrongs and he would be the supreme judge of the universe and that all people would give an account to him. And Paul said, that's why I'm serving. You're my joy, you're my glory. Here's how Paul viewed the church. He viewed them as a crown. 
Not as a, a, trying to get a pat on the back or, or, or look what I've done in you, but Paul knew that his church, the people that he won to Christ and the people that he led in a life for Christ, he said, that's why I'm doing this. Because I want to bring glory to God and I want you to be joyous at his coming. And so what I'm doing, I'm doing with the end in mind. I believe this is why a lot of people quit on God because they don't have the end in mind. They think about their here and now. Oh, I'm suffering. Well, everything's not going the way I want it to go. I, I don't feel good in this Christian life, so I might just not go to church as much as I used to. or I, I, might, I might not serve God as fervently as I used to, but they're serving with selfishness in mind, not with the end in mind. Do not forget, never forget, that you're living in light of the judgment. You're living in light of the end. Because there is coming a day when Christ will return for His church. There is coming a day when all unrighteousness will be judged. There is coming a day when Christ will bring His church back with Him to heaven, to glory. There is coming that day when we will be presented before to Jesus Christ, His bride. That's why we live. That's why we uh, uh, tell people about Christ. That's why we disciple and train people to live for Christ. That's why we do church. That's why we are the church. Because we know that all of the promises of God are real. They're all true. And we are serving because He's coming. Jesus spoke a parable in the New Testament about servants doing what they were doing, doing their work. And many, some of, one of them didn't do anything. The others did more. Jesus said, the master said, occupy till I come. Stay busy. Stay busy. Stay busy in the kingdom of God. Hey, there's enough to do for the children of God to keep us busy till he comes. We were speaking of it this morning in our men's prayer time. And I know in Mississippi, they were, somebody was talking about a statistic or a number that maybe at any given time in Mississippi, only 75% of the population is in church on a Sunday morning. Only 75% of the population. And that grows in, in, in the bigger and larger cities. There's plenty to do in the kingdom of God. There is much work to be done. We're not doing this for ourselves. We're not doing this to get pat on the back. We're not doing it so someone will say, well, hey, look at Chunky Church. Look what they're doing for the glory of God. That's not why we're doing it. We're doing it for the Lord. No human eye may ever see what we do, but we do it because there is one all-seeing eye that's watching. And we do it for His glory. So Paul, we see in this text, his service to the church. But greater than Paul's service to the church, I see Jesus in each of these points. And I believe Paul was emulating Christ. We've already spoken at the beginning how he served the church with love. Christ served the church with love. Paul believed that service was better with a personal touch. Look at what Christ did. Have this mind in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. A personal touch. Christ became a man and lived among us. The disciples, you remember in the upper room before he was arrested that night in Gethsemane, what was one of the last things he did with his disciples? He washed their feet. He didn't have to wash their feet, but he served them. He served them. So Christ knew that service was better with a personal touch. Paul served with opposition, and so did Christ. Christ was very opposed on this earth to the point where they killed him because they opposed him, but he still served. And then he also served with the end in mind. I think of Hebrews chapter 12 where the Bible tells us to lay aside every weight and the sin that besets us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the shame and, 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 and saw what was coming, saw what the Father was doing at the end. That's what Christ did. Christ served with the end in mind. We have an example to follow in Christ. We can look to Jesus. You may be here this morning and you may say, Brother Matt, I don't understand. One thing you're talking about, you might not be a Christian this morning. Today is a good day to come to Christ. Christ is your only hope. Outside of Christ, there is only wrath. There is only hell. There is only judgment for sin. Inside of Christ, we receive grace upon grace upon grace. So I invite you to come to Jesus if you haven't already. If you have come to Christ, you've been called to be a servant. A servant of the church. A servant of God. Let's be busy about the Father's work. Father, 
We come before you in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you for loving us and giving us Christ. We pray that you would help us, that we would do as you've called us to do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.